Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening. Uh, any questions? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So uh, let me uh, resume to where we were. So, uh, so remember there was a, an elliptic equation in the background, and then there was an object called the conormal gradient of U and solving uh, an evolution equation for certain differential operator D and uh, bounded matrix B associated to with A, um, F. So here, just remember that the setup is uh, the upper half space. Okay, and the coefficient I chose to uh, let them depend on X only. Okay, and so uh, we had this equation and we had another equation which is a conserved property of a evolution in time. Okay, so and then we constructed the semigroup E minus uh, T mod DB where mod DB is this uh, operator uh, obtained using the H infinity calculus of DB. Okay, and then so it's a semi-group on L2 with the analytic property, uh, uniformly bounded. Okay, and uh, with this, we, we had also important operators which were the spectral projections. Uh, the two images um, ranges of these projections which uh, split these two spaces split the range of db which is nothing but the range of d which is a set of l2 elements f with this condition okay so that's what we uh, saw the last time okay so before I, so I, I was telling you that uh, um, we're going to we're going to change topology. We did that already in you know, ensemble spaces, but I want to do some hardy spaces. Uh, but before I do that, uh, uh, some detour um, to um, layer potential. But what I want to say is that this way of writing things uh, encodes uh, also the layer potential. So what are they in this framework? So let me just define two operators, SCF. So F will be uh, any element that you like, an L2 element, but on the boundary. But uh, this time it's valued in CM and you'll see why. So STF, you may define it uh, for T positive and T negative. And for T positive, so you have some sign rules which are a little painful to follow, but it exists. Okay, and but then you apply this not to uh, to F, which is the first coordinate here in the uh, in the setup. So F would be the scalar coordinate of some vector, and the second coordinate of this vector would be zero. And then when you apply this thing, you just take the first coordinate of whatever you get. This is for T positive and uh, for T negative, you have basically the same thing, except that you change the spectral projection to have the negative one. Okay, and here D, uh, the inverse, you can interpret it as an operator uh, which maps the range of D, okay, into, uh, it's a closed operator into the, uh, um, Double F space, homogeneous double F space H1, okay? And then you, you project it on the range, which I call this. So the set of 
double F elements in this space which have this curl condition C. Okay. Um, and then you can define another guy. Oops. And then you have to switch to BD. But basically it's comparable formula. And then you apply this to uh, elements of this type. And again, you take the scalar part. And then uh, here, this is a plus four. Okay, so these are definitions. And these definitions were, in fact, introduced by Andreas Rosen. Okay, but uh, given the fact that we have this um, the functional calculus of db and I said also of bd, okay, yesterday, uh, we have uh, um, clearly from, for example, from this formula that dt is bounded on L2 uh, uniformly over Q. Okay, now a little bit of calculation shows that you can compute the conormal gradient of ST from this formula. And if you compute the conormal gradient of ST, it amounts to uh, eliminate this D inverse. In fact, in the formula, I'm changing some signs, so let me not do it. But you can compute it, so you eliminate this D inverse. You change the signs a little bit, but that's not a big problem. And you remove this, this thing. Uh, maybe I should, well, maybe I should stop. Write it. If you compute it, then that's what you get is E minus T mod db chi plus db of f0. But now you get the full vector, so I don't take the scalar part. So this is for t positive. And for t negative, you get uh, this with the opposite sign, the chi minus. OK, so a little bit of computation gives you that. And again, if you look at the boundness of these operators on L2, this gives you that this is uniformly bounded in L2. Okay, so the, I'm not doing anything but defining operators from the functional calculus at the moment. But what, what is interesting is that Andreas Rosen, so why did he introduce this? Uh, he proved that if uh, divergence A grad is a scalar real uh, equation uh, operator, then uh, ST and uh, DT coincide uh, on, well, maybe on smooth function with the usual layer potential. Integrals. Okay, so let me just give you the formula for the linear potential. So that is ST of F of X would be equal to an integral of fundamental solution for A, uh, TX, SY, U restrict to S equals zero, and you apply it to F. Well, gamma A is a fundamental solution uh, of uh, dive a grad on the full space, of course, and the integral here is on Rn. And then for the double layer potential, then we get a formula which is uh, f and then f of y, and then you have to take the adjoint. Uh, let me just. Uh, put the variable at the right place, sy, tx. Then you take the conormal derivative with respect to the adjoint of A in the y variable, okay, in a uh, ys variable. And then you make s, uh, you, make, uh, you, you make s equals zero, uh, and that's something, dy. And gamma A star is a fundamental solution for A star. Okay, so 
So these are the classical formula. Once you have the uh, um, fun, uh, fundamental solution, so uh, actually uh, Andreas was able to construct the fundamental solution from uh, his requirements, but the fundamental solution had been also constructed before by Hoffman and Kim uh, in this framework of uh, real scalar operators or even more generally. Okay, uh, of course, when A is the identity, you get the Laplacian, so you get the usual fundamental solution. Okay, so no news uh, about that. Okay, so you have, so in other words, his, his purpose was to say that you have the usual integral formulas for the layer potential. You can embed these formulas into, uh, to create an operator, and this operator embed into a family, a larger family of operators which are uniformly bounded on L2. Okay, and uh, and doing this, he proved at the same time that the layer potential had uh, this uh, L2 boundedness property. Okay, so so now what's the so what do we do with this? So let me remind you uh, how we construct solution. So we take an H in H2 plus dB, and then we construct a solution U of or uh, equation on the upper half space by setting the conormal gradient of u equal to v e minus uh, t mod db of h. Now, uh, writing this, you may think that and you really set h to be the conormal gradient of u at time t equals zero, right? Uh, because you have strong limit in L2, so you define this object. And this object is nothing but conormal of u at time t equals zero. And uh, tangential derivative of u at time t equals zero. So let me just rework a little bit with this formula. Uh, so you have e minus uh, mod t db applied to h, but h is an element in the spectral space, so you can insert. And let me uh, let me say here that t is positive. Okay, in this case, so you can insert the spectral projection k plus because it acts like the identity on this space. Okay, and then I start uh, doing stupid thing, which is to say that this H is, has two elements. So the first one is gonna be this one. Okay, and the second one is gonna be this one, the linear algebra at this point. Okay, and if I do this, uh, I can work out a little bit of algebra to realize that uh, so this first term is nothing but uh, nothing but what I wrote there. So grad a s t uh, applied to the conormal derivative of u at time t equals zero. That's for the first term, and the second term you don't see it on the board, but if you rewrite a little, work out a little bit of things, then you can make it, make a sense of it by saying that this is a conormal gradient of dt applied to u at t equals zero uh, in some appropriate sense. Okay, let me not uh, worry about this for this talk. Okay, and, okay, so now if you, if you eliminate the conormal gradient, which you can do, then you have this equality well, maybe up to a constant. And depending on the situation, then you work out the constants could be zero, could be non-zero, depending on the uh, assumptions you want to put on it. Okay? So, but this is, this is a, a layer potential formula. And this is a, a strategy that you can, of course, use to try to solve any boundary value problem. Suppose you know this guy, you want to have access to that guy. Once you have it, then you have you, okay? And conversely. All right. So, so you can use this method. So it's not completely uh, orthogonal to a previous method. It uh, it is really a method uh, of layer potential, if you want. Okay. So now let's. So it's especially interesting if you can work this method in different types of topology. Yes. Okay, so there's, yeah, there's, 
So for, for, for single layer, you have to use. For the double layer, you have to use VD. It's just how it comes from the uh, functional calculus. So it's and then it fits the Green's formula. It's exactly the Green's formula in the abstract setting, too. Uh, except that I don't integrate by parts, right? I, I cannot integrate by parts. I don't even know if I have integrals, too. So it's just operator thing. Uh, let me just uh, mention a rule of thumb. When you, when you want to compute with DB and NBD, so here, so the rule of thumb is that db times d is equal to d times bd. Okay, so whenever you have, uh, whenever you apply d to this uh, guy on the left, then you can move d inside, bd becomes db, and the d goes outside. So you have this rule of thumb that works ex exactly on the functional calculus. Okay, so. So maybe this is integration by parts. Okay, this is that. Okay. Uh, so let me go to uh, do the, a little bit of hard space. So we had a little bit of hard space theory uh, by uh, in the talk of. Uh, yesterday. Uh, so the, 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 the thing to remember is that you have the usual theory of Hardy spaces and including Lobeck spaces. So they're characterized by sand spaces. And of course you have like uh, BMO also and uh, all the spaces they're characterized by Carlson measures. which can be seen in the family of sand spaces, okay? Um, so maybe it's just uh, in one line. I remember you what is a sand space for P between zero and infinity. So uh, an element, which is an L2-lock element, is in a sand space if you have a certain area functional, which is in LP. And the area functional is just uh, the integral on cones with some aperture like this, okay, uh, arbitrary aperture, but then you put f of t y squared dy dt dm plus one. Okay, so that's a f of it. And you can change the aperture as you want. Okay, so that's, that's this. And for alpha, um, positive, um, and infinite, you have the space of Carlson measure t infinity to alpha, which is um, which is characterized by a condition which says c alpha f is in l infinity, and c alpha is what it's the supremum of uh, all possible balls containing the point x, so all Euclidean balls in R n, okay of one over the measure of the ball, the big measure, one over the radius of the ball to the power two alpha, then integral over some tent of a uh, d of f dy squared dy dt m one half. And the tent is what? You take this ball here and then you just draw a tent above it. and the radius is. Okay, so, so now you want to define how these spaces. Um, okay, so what do we have to, what do we have for Operators T of the form DB or BD. We have two things. We have H infinity calculus uh, on L2, and we have the off diagonal estimates of order n for any n for the resolvent. So I 
wrote these estimates uh, yesterday. Okay, so uh, with these two tools, well, we have actually, let me just correct the history by uh, here. We have two papers that uh, did that. There's a paper by Hoffman Meboroda for, in some special cases, but it was clear from these two special cases uh, that you could do more. Oops. And, and a paper by uh, myself, Macintosh and Ruth. But you can develop a notion of how this space adapted to T under these two conditions. Meboroda. Sorry. Um, Okay, but here there's a slight difficulty. The off-diagonal estimates for resolvents, they are, let me just mention, they are L2 to L2. So Pierre talked to us about LT to LQ of diagonal estimates. Here it's only L2, L2. And this is not, not you cannot improve this. You cannot go from 2 to, uh, to 2 plus epsilon in general. And why is that? Uh, the reason is that these operators are not injective. Okay, so these are not injective, so they cannot improve regularity on the null space. For example, the Lebesgue integrability on the null space. So, uh, so therefore, you're stuck to that, but that's not too much of a problem. You can still do it, but then you have to work on a range. So you have to restrict yourself to the range of T and develop the hardy space theory inside the range. So let me just give a definition of a possible hardy space. Uh, so you take a psi which is in your classes of holomorphic function that vanish at zero and infinity in some sector. And then, let me just uh, define an element H is in this space, if and only if it's, it's in a range. And you have some 10 condition on the, on this element. So this, this is to mean a function of t and x, okay? And you see has a function like this function f, and you want to measure this in, in LT. So in other words, let me raise the a. I want this to be in TPP. Okay, so that's a space that depends on the function psi, but uh, the general theory tells you that you can uh, identify a large class of a large subclass of psi for which this space does not depend on the choice of psi, and the norms that are given with two different psi in this class are equivalent. Okay, so let me not uh, spend too much time on this. Uh, you can define also some Hölder spaces in the same spirit. Again, requiring that you work in a range and um, psi t, so psi dot t h belongs to T infinity to alpha. Uh, right. Okay, so you can define some Lipschitz space adapted to T this way. All right, so again, you have a large number of psi for which these spaces are all the same with equivalent norms. Okay. So the nice uh, feature about this, this definition is that if F is a bounded holomorphic function in a sector S mu, then F of T is bound f of t, so it was a priori bounded on the range of t by the functional calculus, but now it extends to a bounded operator on any of its spaces. Of course, with bound controlled by the subnorm of f. And uh, in particular, this applies to the semigroup, like this. And so therefore, this semigroup extends to a semigroup on any of these space, and in particular, with a specific argument, you can show that is a is a continuous semigroup on well uh, on H P T. Uh, okay, so now I drop the psi from the from the notation from now on, assuming that I work in one of those spaces for which I have good psi. Okay, uh, so this is a continuous semigroup on on this space. Up to the um, up to x equals zero. Okay, this is not well. This is continuous of this um, this is continuous on on this space if you equip it with some some kind of weak star topology. Okay, let me just mention that there is some uh, uh, duality all the way in this framework. So 
TP2 and TP2 are dual spaces. So if uh, P is less than one, uh, between 1 and infinity and P' is a conjugate exponent. But if P is less than 1, and if you pick alpha, it's N 1 over P minus 1. So you have TP2, uh, sorry, T infinity to alpha is a dual of TP2. Okay, so it works this direction, of course. This is not reflective uh, in this case. TP2 for P less than 1 uh, is, is, a, is a quasi banner space, not a banner space. So uh, having this, then you can, you, you can set some dualities. Uh, for example, you can see that HPT and HP prime P star are in duality. Uh, for for what for the for the L2 inner product on which you started from so the L2 inner product was H of X V of X bar V X okay uh, let me also mention that at this point these spaces are, are are spaces of measurable function because I was careful to pick H in uh, the range so I get a space with a norm or a quasi norm. Uh, but it's not complete, so of course what we do in analysis, we complete the space. But then a difficulty occurs. The difficulty is that when you complete the space, uh, it may not be a, a space of distribution. It's just a space of abstract elements, okay, the abstract completion of, of something. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to, comp so HP, I remove one bar, I had a double bar there, so I remove, this is a completion of H double bar PT, and then lambda alpha T is equal to the completion of this H uh, lambda alpha double bar T, okay? So there are abstract space. Okay, so let me just give an example saying that there may not be abstract spaces. In fact, in, in some cases, well, the case where uh, db, b is equal to the identity. So we look at hp, d, and lambda alpha, d. Then hp, d, you can uh, work it out and you can identify it uh, very easily. Uh, so this is p of lp. I will say what is p in a moment when p is between 1 and infinity and P of HP when P is between. So here there's a restriction on the range of P, uh, N of N plus 1, when S plus 1 is ambient dimension and N is boundary dimension. Oops, sorry. Okay, LP is the usual Lebesgue space. So here the, the Lebesgue space, the X spaces are going to be spaces on Rn of functions valued in T capital N. Okay? And for this one, we have P applied to BMO for alpha is equal to zero and we have P applied to the usual Lipschitz space for alpha between zero and one. Okay, so what is P? P is the orthogonal projection from L2 into the range of D. So if you work out what is P, then you can see that P, in fact, acts as the identity on the scalar part, and it acts as a matrix of rich transforms, like this, on the tangential part. Okay, so this, op this operator is a very nice singular integral operator. We all know about this. So there is no question we can understand what is uh, P of LP, so it's a range of LP under this bounded projection on LP, and, and the same for all these different spaces. And so when I write these equalities, I write the equalities of sets, and then I had a definition in terms of square function for this guy, but now I have a definition in terms of LP topology for PLP, HP topology there, BMO topology, lambda alpha topology. Okay, equality of sets and equivalence of topology. All right. That's why I restrict to this. Uh, this is the reason for this restriction. 
yeah, otherwise I would have more. I would need to have more uh, moment conditions somehow on the atom. Okay. So, so with this two things, so uh, the problem is when is okay HP DB. Let me look at this guy first. A good space. Okay, a good space. A space of functions or distributions or cross distributions would be good for me. And you realize what if it, if you want it to be a good space, it has to be equal to HPD. So the question is that uh, that is uh, namely when is HPD is equal to HPD, which means again, now you have realized HPD with its different topologies. You have you would have you would be able to pick a different topology on this space, which is the LP or HP topology. Okay, and here P is is restricted to this time. Okay, and so the uh, first answer that we the answer that we found with uh, uh, Sebastian Stahlhuls is the following. So there, there always exists, uh, let me put it this way, an open interval um, I, which depends on dB, I dB, which is contained in this n plus n of n plus 1 plus infinity with, in fact, equality of the pre Hardy spaces, that is, the Hardy spaces you define before you take completion. Why am I doing this? It's just to stress the fact that these two spaces are good because they are embedded in uh, they are uh, yeah embedded in the range of D, in the L2 range of D. Okay, so you can look at the equality of sets before you take completion and with equivalent norms, so therefore you decide that the completion of this guy is equal to that guy. Okay? So that's how I mean it. Okay, so we've equivalent norms or quasi norms, okay? And in this case, then you take completions and they become the same. Okay, so, but not only this. So this is just the Hardy space theory. Let me comment on this before uh, I move on. So yesterday we had this uh, explanation by uh, Pierre Kunzmann in the case where uh, DB was replaced by an elliptic operator L and in this case, then L was injective, in fact. And L was injective, so you can hope to have that the Hardy space is equal to all of LP. But when the operator is not injective, of course, you see that uh, you don't get, here it's clear from this case, you don't get all of LP, you get a subspace of LP or HP or any of these guys. Okay, so you have to work in, in subspaces. So in fact, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good news because uh, it's a good news because if you think of the boundary value problem in the background, then you really want the boundary data to be uh, functions, LP, HP, BMO, lambda alpha, I mean classical uh, functions. So taking the projections here is no big deal, as far as you can see. Now the difference with uh, what Pierre Kosman was saying yes, uh, yesterday is that, so I don't have the general Gaussian estimate that he was mentioning. I only have this L2 to L2 of diagonal estimate. Okay, so uh, I don't have improvement of uh, Lebesgue integrability uh, by applying the resolvent or by applying the semigroup. Uh, if I decide to work off all of LP, but if I decide to work on, on restricted range here uh, of on, on this projection of LP or HP, so on such spaces, then I can have improvement. So on the range, I have properties that I used to know uh, if, uh, as if the operator was objective. But again, uh, I have some improvement, but there's no way I can get LP to LQ of diagonal estimate for P less than Q. And this is something which is completely lost in this framework. So you have to work with it and, and make your way through it and, and uh, uh, still obtain the result. So I will describe what is this interval in a, in a minute. Um, but let me uh, add something to this theorem, saying that now, now you have identified this interval, 
you may want to go back to the boundary value problem or your interest and then try to see what happens for these semi-group uh, solutions, okay? And then, so if H is in the range of D, okay, so you, let's get an a priori estimate without taking completions of anything. And then you pick F of Tx to be your semi-group. So here, H could be uh, in a plus space, a negative space, or a sum of two elements like this. I don't care at this point. Okay, then you have that uh, some quantities are equivalent. So Td by dtft, which you want to measure in Tp2. And uh, you can also replace Td by dt by Tdb of uh, ft. So let me just say that this is ft of x. I put the t in a subscript here. So here I use uh, I use one variable uh, shows up one variable this t is the same as the t is in the integral, and I don't show the other variable. Well, I mean there's no good notation here, but this is the one I pick. So this is equivalent to this, uh, and this is equivalent to the HP d norm of h. The HP d of norm of f is uh, you look at this list. It's either the LP topology or the HP topology, depending on the value of Tb. Okay, the interval here could be uh, could have values less than one here. Okay, so the difference here is when you take d by dt of ft. Well, you when you take d by dt, you pick up a mod db. Okay, which is uh, signum db times db. So it's a different operator. Okay, so you get this. Now the third information that we were able to obtain. As usual, when you have square function estimate, you also want non-transfer maximal function estimate. And again, now for the same age, but in the spectral spaces, okay, and the same f, then we have as a non-transfer maximal estimate of f here in LP is equivalent to h in HPD. Okay, but here the difference is that I have well. Not always. Ac actually, uh, I can even we can even improve this statement, but let me not be picky about this uh, for now. Uh, this is of interest for the solutions of the PD because uh, this is how we construct it for the plus to get the solution in the upper half space and minus solution in the uh, lower half space. Okay, so we have a complete description of uh, quantities that are interested for the boundary value problem for this range of Ts. Um, Okay, uh, let me let me say something. Okay, so I told you well, HPDB here is was defined using your favorite function psi. Okay, but psi has to satisfy some conditions for the general theory to apply, and it may be that this psi that you take here, which is like for example z e to the minus signum of z times z, for example, this one. It could be that for some values of phi, this psi is outside of the range predicted by the general theory. So you have to do something here, uh, but you have to do something and you can do something because in fact, a function like this is not an arbitrary uh, bounded holomorphic function. It has some, of course, some good behavior near zero. Uh, for example, because if, for example, if you restrict this function in, in the right sector, if you restrict this function to right sector, signum becomes one, so that becomes z e minus z. So this is a restriction of uh, an entire function. So an entire function is very good at the origin. So in other words, it's better than just having this decay one at the origin. It's a restriction of an analytic function in the neighborhood of zero, and you can use this uh, in the proof here. Okay. Uh, right. So. Just a comment about this interval i. I will not try to prove any of these statements. Uh, it's most of the thesis of uh, Sebastian, actually, so it's a number of pages. Uh, but I can indicate what what we know about this interval i. Okay, so i is. How do we get i? So 
So the first thing we say is that there is a first interval of the form p minus p plus, depending on d and b, like this, on which, and this interval is open in context 2, on which uh, db has h infinity calculus on LP, by, by LP I mean LP, the, the full space LP, so the range in LP is, is there and the null space in LP is there. Okay, and you have the splitting of these both things. <laughs> All right, uh, but this, this interval in general can be small, it can be something like 2 minus epsilon, 2 plus epsilon. In the PD language, this corresponds to the fact that you have a Hodge decomposition adapted to the uh, 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 fields A grad. And, di and divergent free. So, um, um, okay, so, so this interval could be small, but it exists, okay? And, uh, and then, so this is the first step, and then uh, once you have this i, okay, then outside this interval, there's no way you can, in fact, this is a sharp thing, this is, this is a maximal interval on which you have this. And outside this interval, you lose the H infinity calculus on, the, on LP, so you, you have to restrict yourself to the range in LP, which is given by this P of LP, you have to work in there. And in there, you have more, okay? In there, you have more. Then you find I, which contains P minus lower star and P plus, where these are these two numbers, and P lower star is just some sub LF exponent. Lower sub LF exponent. Okay, so that's something that was already uh, observed in different settings that you can improve from one lower sub LF exponent, some estimate, like for example for square root. Uh, I had some result like this, and as you can, I use that in solving some uh, PDEs also um, uh, of this type. Okay, so this interval contains this. So for example, there are two cases which are very good, n equal 1 and n eb. Then you have p minus is 1 and p plus is plus infinity, so and p uh, minus lower star is then n over n plus 1. So this is as big as you can expect. Uh, so this is boundary dimension. Boundary dimension bigger than 1 and b constant, okay, uh, for example, you may think, okay, what about the Laplacian in this case? What about constant uh, elliptic equations? Then again, you get p minus equal 1, p plus is equal to plus infinity. Okay, and in general, this is uh, the best you, um, well, we didn't prove it was the best you can, uh, probably it is the best you can hope because this exponent is also related to some uh, other exponents and I think the quantum example of Fre, uh, Fre how do you say, Fraser? Fre uh, it's a German, Fre Fraser. Okay, there's a quantum example of Fraser that could apply in this context, but I haven't checked the details. Uh, probably from what you did with uh, Steve and, and um, uh, Alan, uh, it could be checked. Okay, now there's an interesting case. Again, boundary dimension set n bigger than 2. And remember that the A was given into the form of two Bayesian matrices. And suppose that you know that the operator on Rn with coefficient d star have so the solutions of on Rn, when I mean solutions, the weak solutions, are locally bounded and hold a continuum, which is some sometimes we sum up as the degeneric condition for uh, for those solutions. Okay, so this is a company. Uh, this is this comes with uh, quantified estimates, of course. Then, so if then then actually uh, i contains uh, is an interval of the form 1 minus epsilon, 2 plus epsilon. Not the same, of course. So in other words, for example, if a, b, c, and d are real, all of them, and you have an equation, uh, so it's a case of uh, m equal 1, then uh, you can reach intervals that contain uh, 1 and below. Okay, but what's surprising here, if it's a proof, just uses this information, so A, B, and C could be anything complex. Uh, you just have, you just need information on a boundary operator. 
This is probably very linked to the fact that uh, everything here depends on, uh, is t-independent in, in a transverse variable. So there's no dependency in a transverse variable here. Okay, but still it's. Uh, so in this case, A is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a matrix, yes. So A is uh, a matrix acting on Tm, where M is a number of equations, and, and so on. Okay, so let me... <coughs> So let me change a little bit the order of my talk on this stage. Okay, so there's another statement for uh, there's another statement for uh, with the BD operator that is useful for uh, Dirichlet problem. But let me just change a little bit because I'm running out of time, and let me mention that. Um, Okay, we may ask ourselves, okay, now we have built solutions. So in various topologies, topologies for, for the initial value, H. Okay, remember that in this context, this is really an initial value term. Okay, so we have L2, we have L, we have P for range of P in I, we have several spaces and so on, okay? So then now the question is, uh, is there a converse? And we have, for these solutions, we have some estimates. Okay, so uh, the question is, is there a converse? And the answer is yes, there is a converse. And this is what we obtained more recently with uh, Mihaly's Mongoglu. So, and the statement is the following, so you take a solution to dive A grad U equals zero, weak solution again. Um, what do I want, how do I want to say that? Okay, and you let P be in the interval I that we just identified. Okay, in this range. Then the following are equivalent. The first thing which is uh, the first condition is that you want the non-tensional maximal estimate on in LP of the gradient of U. So gradient is here in TNS. The second condition is the square function estimate that I, for example, wrote here. So T d by dt grad dx U uh, in TP2 is finite. Well, since you have uh, one more derivative on uh, the gradient than, than here, you need to impose some condition uh, just to eliminate constants or something like this. And so, if for example, you impose that grad e tx of u, okay, you look at this as a function of x, and you let t go to infinity, it should tend to zero in the space of distribution. So when you integrate against a very good test function, then uh, it should tend to zero, uh, sorry, it tends to infinity. And the third condition is there exists a unique H in HP plus DB such that the conormal gradient of U at Tx is given by this semigroup acting on H at X. So in other words, we constructed here solutions from a semigroup method. They satisfy a number of estimates, and here we prove so in other words, we started from this, we constructed this solution, and we proved such and such estimate. Here we prove the converse. From this estimate, you get this. From this estimate, you get this. They are all equivalent. Uh, uh, let me just mention here that I'm, I'm using this same notation for the extent, the appropriate extension of the semigroup on, 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 on this stage. Okay. All right, so, so in other words, and then once you have this, you can set H is equal to the polynomial gradient of U at time t equals zero. Okay, so you have given a meaning to the trace of a conormal gradient of u at the boundary. This is this h because this semigroup is uh, continuous in the topology you're interested in. Okay, so there is a limit. And not only there is a limit, but I told you that you can have uh, almost everywhere limits of uh, Whitney averages, for example, like this. 
uh, on Whitney averages. This goes to uh, h um, of x when t goes to zero, and this is in the almost everywhere sense. So this is valid, but this is valid only in the uh, Lebesgue range, uh, or even the Hardy space range, so h1. But of course, for p below one, you have distribution, so this, this statement may not make any sense because h is a, a distribution. This is for the law, uh, this is, okay, this is for Rn plus one, plus, sorry, but you have exactly the same statement for lower half space, independently. Plus Rn plus one? Yes, so yes. Plus I'm saying that in the upper half space, any solution with this has this and that. Independently. Independently, it's just a statement for the upper half space. And of course, you have the same statement for the lower half space. Okay, so, um, two words on, on the proof. Um, again, it's really too long to explain, but uh, how do you, uh, I mean, you have to measure the uh, difficult, I mean, difficult, yeah, it was difficult to prove this out, but um, the difficulty from such conditions to a condition like this. Here in the end, you want something to be uniformly bounded on LP, Okay, so if P is less than two, then you can see something, uh, some LP condition from the condition, it's fine. But if P happens to be greater than two, which is possible, uh, this does not even tell you that uh, this is locally LP, okay? Well, you could use some uh, identity of Mayers, but then I would have to restrict my range of P and I don't want uh, to do that, locality of Mayers. So, so, anyway, so you have to, to think that you know some conditions Okay, you take some Whitney cones and you know that this is locally L2 there and you have uh, the LP control, uniform LP control for these quantities and you have to pass from this to a semi-group equation that is something that propagates uniformly in C. Not that these norms, if you think of these norms in the abstract, uh, they're they not translation invariant. Okay. Because you, you, you really take, if you had a pointwise bound, this would be translation invariant. But here you have an L2 log bound which is not translation invariant. Okay, so you have non-translation invariant norms, and at the end you have a translation invariant deformation in, in time, when you shift in time. So, th but the deal to, to prove anything like this, any kind of uniqueness statement for the IVP like this, if you start from the equation, which was supposed to hold in a distribution sense, so you test this equation against uh, testing functions. So how do you build testing functions? So you build, okay, so you take time zero, you take time t, and you build testing functions that satisfy in a variable s here. So t is fixed, so you have a vi uh, variable s. Uh, testing function that satisfy an adjoint uh, condition. Okay, so you test this equation against solution like this, and this solution can be created from um, the semigroup acting, uh, 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 the semigroup uh, associated to B star D. Okay, but you, you make sure that these solutions here have a jump singularity at time T, and then you have to do some uh, limiting argument, uh, 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 10,000 of limiting arguments, and in the end, you get an equation of the form uh, F, F was your, normal gradient, f of t plus uh, tau is equal to semigroup uh, applied to f sub tau. So you get the when t and tau are positive. So you, you really work hard to get the first information that you may uh, want is that an, uh, uh, an intermediate information between this limit case and this thing. So in other words, there's a semigroup rule for this f. And then you have to do some weakly gives argument when you can or some other arguments when you cannot and in the end uh, you get this. But let me just mention that even this equality at first doesn't make any sense if you don't work a little bit because this is meaningful only in the topologies where you have to bound for this semigroup. And I don't know at first that these guys belong to these uh, spaces. So I have to work and introduce some uh, auxiliary spaces for we introduce some auxiliary spaces for, for, for doing this. So it's a long process, but in the end, it all works. 
Uh, another feature is that, of course, this proof works for B is equal to the identity. When B is equal to the identity, we start it from the Laplacian. Okay, so, so in other words, here we get a well-known fact. When B is the identity, this is a Laplace equation, and this statement can be found by just rewriting proofs, uh, uh, rewriting statements that you find in the literature, science book, for example, has this. Okay, so this is no new fact, but what is new is a proof. Because if you think of the Laplace equation, how it's done, they use the Fatou, uh, Fatou lemmas, uh, positivity arguments. Here, I'm doing an argument without positivity arguments, because B is not this complex, okay? So, so if you run this argument, with B is equal to the identity, you get a new proof of this without using the maximum transistor. Surprising, but that's how it is. Okay. Um, let me finish. Oh. How many do you have? Like, you have three, four minutes? Can I take three, four minutes? You're in charge. So. Let me just mention the, the statement that goes with. Um, the thing you want to do for the uh, Dirichlet problem. If you, if you want to solve the Dirichlet problem, again, I'm not solving the Dirichlet problem. So there's a second theorem of, okay, and then uh, there's a second theorem which I concatenate into one. Um, okay, where is it? Okay, so again, let P be an interval I for which HP db is equal to hpd, okay? And then I'm going to set q is equal to p prime if p is bigger than 1 and alpha is equal to n, 1 over p minus 1, if p is less than 1, okay? So this can happen. So in this case, what do we have? So let me just restrict to uh, solutions. Um, um, ah, yes, okay, um, let me do it this way, uh, db tilde, ah, what is this b tilde, okay, uh, and plus or minus, well, you add the a from the equation, and then the a creates a b for the cauchy riemann equation, now if you start from a star, well, life would be easy if you create B star, but it doesn't. It creates B tilde. And B tilde is some uh, flip uh, of B like this, B star like this. So it's really explicit, but it's not B star. Okay? So you have to work with this guy. And then you create the F tilde of Tx to be the semi-group applied to uh, apply to this H, maybe let me put a tilde all the way so that it's consistent. Okay, so that creates a solution of the adjoint equation, adjoint equation diagram, okay? On the upper half space or on the lower half space, depending on, on whether you, uh, you take plus or minus. Okay, uh, well, let, let me just take plus just to make things uh, easier. Then, then what we pick, what we get is the following. But if you let t times ft tilde, and you measure this in tq2, this is equivalent to some norm on h tilde, which is in fact a Sobolev norm of uh, regularity negative one and exponent q. That's how we pick. Now, this is the area functional So let me just say that this is grad AU. So this is the area functional that is usually denoted by ST grad U in, the, uh, in, in LT, in LQ, in the literature, okay? So this area functional is really equivalent to the, this norm on the full uh, initial uh, value here, H tilde. Now if you jump to alpha, then you get a Carlson measure estimate. And if you get a Carlson measure estimate, you have to measure this in some Lipschitz space of order alpha minus one. That's what it's 
is, and for alpha is equal to zero, this is BM also, minus one. Okay? So this is equivalent without, uh, well, without any other assumption. So now, uh, this was what we did with Sebastian, and, and next, of course, we tried the same theorem uh, with Mihailis, and we were able to prove a convert. And I will finish by this. So the converse, okay, so in fact the following are equivalent. So if you have a solution, a weak solution to the adjoint equation, again, I'm in the assumption of the statement here. So this is one, so I, I do have this assumption. Okay, then, uh, then uh, if I assume T grad U in T Q2 finite, and again, I need some condition at infinity. Here you can look. You just need to have that this goes to zero um, when t goes to infinity. But in the sense of distribution, eventually modulo constants. You don't need to know what kind of constants you're dealing with here, but suffices. You can remove this uh, condition depending on the value of q. But for q large, say, in to close infinity, you have to put something like this. And the second condition is that uh, the conormal gradient of u is given by some semigroup. No, here, oh sorry, the conormal gradient in with respect to a star, of course. This semigroup with respect to b tilde applied to h tilde, and of course the h is unique in a s well in a space that you have to define like you define the Hardy space, but let me not just do it. And this is a spectral space in this topology for the bit tilde, which is contained in something like this, which is a classical space. Okay, so again, you have a semi-group equation for this condition. And you have the same in uh, T infinity to alpha. And here with the space lambda alpha minus one dB tilde plus one. Okay, so you have the same statement. So again, you have to start from conditions that are far from being clear how you apply the semigroup on anything, and then uh, full, uh, and find your way to, uh, to this semigroup equation. All right, so this has a number of consequences for the uh, boundary value problem, but again, uh, let me stress, I was not solving the boundary value problem, but I'm, I'm just saying if you want to solve the boundary value problem, now the thing is completely transparent, of course there are already results on solving, like for example, the results on real uh, matrices recently by uh, Svetlana, Steve, uh, Carlos Koenig, and, and, Mabro, uh, and Steve Pfeiffer. But uh, I'm just saying, for example, if you want to solve, for example, LU is equal to zero, you impose the non tangential maximum gradient in LT, for P in your range, of course, and then having this, you know you have a trace, so you can speak of so, for example, the Neumann data of u at t equals zero to be in LT. Okay, so the trace happens in LP topology or almost everywhere uh, if well, LP or, or HP, if P is below one. Okay, then you can uh, say exactly when you have a solution, when it's unique. So, the, the trick is that you have this space. Okay, and then you create a map from H, which goes into the scalar part of this map, because this happens to be the scalar part of the conormal gradient. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is going to be HP. And then this map is clearly bounded into HP or LP, depending on the value of P. Okay? So existence of solution, existence of U, is equivalent to the map is on two. And uniqueness of u of solution is equivalent to n this is uh, one one okay so you have a complete description of the boundary space and when you have this and the boundary value problem can be formulated in very uh, sharp ways and you know exactly what you have to do to prove solvability and again i'm not doing i'm not proving solvability maybe not yet i'm finished
Ah, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, you take so this. Okay. All right. So the uh, and you suppose that A is uh, real, uh, real, real, and uh, then you have a scalar. Scalar means that you have just one equation here. Okay. Then you have this B. And then this gives you an interval of the form 1 minus epsilon 2 plus epsilon prime. Okay, but if you look at the way I stated things, then you look at the adjoint equation, and then you start with a P, which is in this interval, and then you take the dual. Okay, so then the interval that comes with is you have to work with 2 plus epsilon prime plus infinity for Q, and eventually you have some alpha, which is uh, zero and uh, whatever it was uh, here, N, one over one minus epsilon minus one. Okay, so in other words, for a real scalar operator, you know that for the Dirichlet problem, you're gonna work in an intervals of values of Q like this. So this is a Dahlberg. Uh, yes. Uh, Yes, the epsilon. Okay, the epsilon here is the one that you get from uh, the holder regularity of solutions. You, you said I, w I had a statement saying if you had all the regularity of some solutions, of some equations, then you get uh, one minus epsilon. So the epsilon is uh, quantitative from this uh, holder regularity information. So I can write a formula uh, which says that epsilon is at uh, least this should be bigger for some other reason, but I don't know. And if you want to, to work for the uh, Neumann problem, then you use this interval, okay, because this is, this is this thing. Okay, so you work for P a little bit above two and down to one and even below one for Hardy space. What okay, so if, if I take a solution satisfying the Carlson measure, right? I know nothing else. Okay. So if you have this, I mean, just be explicit. For for real equation again, huh? I mean, for for range for range on which you can do this. Let me just say that in this theorem, I assume the p was in this interval. Outside this range, I know nothing. No, no, no. I, okay, just, okay. All right. Ah. No, okay, okay, okay. 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 Right, all right. So what I'm telling you is that if you have this, then you have a trace of this guy uh, in BMO inverse. So the trace says that the uh, u at equal zero is in BMO and there's a conormal derivative in BMO inverse. Okay, this is what I'm saying. Now, uh, okay, do I have uniqueness? Uh, the answer is not completely clear, why? For example, you can assume that your Dirichlet data is a little better than BMO. It's in uh, um, um, H one half. Okay. If it's H one half, uh, let me finish. If it's H one half, you can construct an energy solution from H one half. 
what I don't know and what I don't think is true is that um, that uh, I have coincidence of this energy solution with that particular solution. They could, they could be different. They, they could be different. Because uh, energy solution is a different story. You're not using this map and pub that I was writing here. You're using the Dirichlet Neumann map. Uh, I know if I have some kind of uh, one oneness of the corresponding map here. Okay, uh, for example, I know uniqueness. Okay, this could be interest uh, in you. I know uniqueness if I can solve the regularity problem for the adjoint for element one. Okay, um, I mean, I, I cannot. I cannot say uniqueness out of the blue, of course. Uh, I say uniqueness of the initial value problem, which is this. But now for the boundary value problem, I'm missing one piece of data, and then this is another game that is starting. Okay, so I'm just careful to say that the DB method may stop here as far as representation of solution is uh, on the board. If you want to solve, this is maybe not the DB game that's going to play some role. Actually, most of the proof are without the DB game except for, for the cathode phase. Yeah, I need I need to start with a class of solutions. The weak solutions are fine. Yeah. Uh, but what I'm no, 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 no. Well, but uh, you need to define what is solution. Well, but if I assume this condition, for example, this T integrability, I, I encode the L2 lock on, on grad U, so I encode U in W1 2 lock. Okay. I mean, you you know, I mean, any, any pe I mean, people doing TDE and and more. I mean, they know that uniqueness doesn't resist uh, going to the limit. Okay. If you if you if you define a solution by a limit process, then uniqueness you have to prove it by a different way. You, you cannot just say uh, if I have uniqueness before I take the limit, I have uniqueness in the limit. Okay. So. I can prove some uh, approximation, if you want, of solution in this class by energy solution, if I want. But then uh, that doesn't say uh, in the end. I mean, that doesn't say immediately um, if I have uniqueness of the boundary value problem that I'm interested in. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure to understand exactly the question, but I mean, so, so it's just what I'm saying is that uniqueness is equivalent to a one oneness of this bound, okay? Uh, and uniqueness of what? Uniqueness in the class which is written here, for example. No other condition. Uniqueness in this class, okay? So, so if you tell me you can construct another solution. Uh, by a different method, and I know that I have one one s, then I know that the two solutions are the same. Okay. Uh, if I don't know this, then I cannot say. Huh? I cannot say. I still need to prove something else. Yes. 